All right, everybody open your Bibles, if you would please, with me to the book of Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. This is prophecy message number 9 in our prophecy series. I just want to say a word very quickly that this is the message that if you have not watched any of our previous eight messages on prophecy, I don't know how else to say it, you are really at a distinct disadvantage. This chapter begins the judgment chapters of Revelation that have been so grossly misinterpreted. And this is the chapter where that if you have no background at all and you've not watched any of the previous uh, messages giving you all the, the biblical background leading up to this chapter, you're going to be quite lost as we get into it because, quite frankly, you've never heard this probably before. Well, we'll put it this way. According to the statisticians, 80% of you have never heard what I'm going to say today because of the Schofield Futurist doctrine which monopolized evangelical Christianity, including the televangelists and the radio preachers and everybody else. Everything you've heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse is totally and patently untrue. So I'm going to say things today and you're going to be scratching your head going, wow, how did he get to that interpretation? Well, if you go back and if you watch prophecy package number one, which is six of the, of the prophecy messages, you'll begin to understand. And then, of course, the seventh prophecy message, when did John write the book of Revelation? That is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. Knowing when John wrote the book is the key to understanding the book. If John wrote it in 95 AD, then Schofield and all his version might have a point. But if it was written before 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem, then it changes the meaning of the entire book. And so that's why that message is so important. That was message number seven. And then last time, a few weeks ago, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that was message number eight. So those are the messages that we preached leading up to this series that we continue today. And of course, the granddaddy of them all, the message that started everything along this line of thought, the destruction of Jerusalem, which I preached in 2019. This is our most popular message by far. And this is the message that I'm going to refer to quite a bit in the message today. So if you've not watched the destruction of Jerusalem message again, you're struggling at a disadvantage and there's nothing I can do about that except hope that maybe you'll be inspired to go back and get caught up by watching these previous messages. Father, help me as I preach your word today. May the Holy Spirit help me to say everything that should be said, nothing that shouldn't be said. And Father, that the Holy Spirit would illuminate truth in the hearts and the lives of everyone who hears. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The title of the message, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and the First Six Seals. Before I get to verse one, I want to do a little review. I think it's very obligatory that I take a few minutes to review slightly so that we can bring uh, the discussion into focus. Remember I told you that Matthew chapter 24 is Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse, which foretold not the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, but the destruction of Jerusalem. Mark and Luke also record their version of the Olivet Discourse, predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. As I said in the message, when did John write the book of Revelation? Revelation 
is John's version of the Olivet Discourse. If you read the Gospel of John, which I pointed out earlier, you will not find the Olivet Discourse. And that's interesting because you got it Matthew, Mark, Luke, but you don't have the Olivet Discourse in John. Why not? Because the Holy Spirit waited until he wrote the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is John's version of the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse was plainly and clearly a prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction in 70 AD, not Christ's second coming at the end of the world. In the message, the destruction of Jerusalem that I just mentioned to you a minute ago, I covered Jesus' predictions of the following. If you, if you watch the message, the destruction of Jerusalem, you'll hear me discuss at length this, these predictions given in the various Olivet Discourses. The appearance of many false Christs that took place, the wars and rumors of wars that took place, the great earthquakes that took place, the famines that took place, the pestilences that took place. Every time, every time you hear these preachers talk about earthquakes going on today and wars and rumors of wars, and they always go back to the Olivet Discourse, and yet all of those things happened just as Jesus said, surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem. The fearful and the great sights in the heavens that took place. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. The distress of nations and the sea and the waves roaring took place. How the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel was fulfilled. We've already talked about that. The promise that the generation that crucified Christ would not pass away until all of Jesus' predictions regarding the destruction of Jerusalem, including the signs I just named, would be fulfilled. And they didn't pass away, and everything was fulfilled. In the message, when did John write the book of Revelation, I quoted Adam Clark. That would be a 19th century Christian scholar who said that Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, and I quote, is presumptive proof that the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, was written before the final overthrow of the Jewish state in 70 AD. So Adam Clark says this is presumptive proof that one verse, Revelation 1-7, that Revelation was written not in 95 AD, but before 70 AD. And if you read, I mean, if you watch that message, when did John write the book of Revelation, I'll tell you exactly when it was written in that message. In the same message, I quoted Matthew Henry, who said, Christ himself, by the way, he's a seventh, uh, 18th century Christian scholar. Christ himself prophesied in the destruction of Jerusalem and about the time in which that was accomplished, the destruction of Jerusalem, he entrusted the apostle John with this book of Revelation. So again, Matthew Henry confirms that John received the book of the Revelation before the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I said in that message, the majority of the revelation, not all of it, but the majority of the revelation is a detailed written record of how the fulfillments of the prophecies of Jerusalem's destruction were about to take place. Revelation chapter 6 begins opening the details of the prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction. This chapter and the rest of the judgment chapters in Revelation are about Jerusalem's destruction, not the second coming of Christ at the end of the world. That is absolutely essential to understanding the book of Revelation. If you want to say it this way, it would be okay. The bulk, the bulk of Revelation details the coming of Christ in judgment on Jerusalem. If you prefer to say it that way, 
that you could say it that way. All right, verses one and two, the first seal, the white horse. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, go back to our last message to talk about the lamb opening the seals. That was in message number eight, uh, the last time. And I saw the lamb open one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, underline that, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts, these are the living creatures that we talked about in the last message, saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The rider of this horse is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. Notice again the noise of thunder associated with the destruction, not just of Jerusalem, but of the entire Jewish system and the old covenant. And I go into that in the Lion of the Tribe of Judah DVD that I mentioned at the onset of my address, which looks like that. I go into quite a bit of detail with that. And then in the Israel package, set two, disc two, message one, which looks like that, I go into great detail describing the significance of the noise of thunder and the lightning and the shaking of the earth, which was associated with the introduction of the old covenant on Mount Sinai, when God gave to Moses the commandments and introduced the old covenant to Israel. And then at the end of the age for the old covenant and the introduction of the new covenant, we find again the lightnings, the thunders, the shaking of the earth, which surrounds the destruction of Jerusalem, signifying the introduction of the new covenant and the destruction of the old covenant. So the lightning and all the thunder and all of that is very significant. And, and, and if you watch all of those messages, you'll have that entire biblical context. Now compare this scene here at the beginning of the description of Jerusalem's destruction with the scene at the end of Jerusalem's destruction in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And I'll just read it for you. And I saw the heaven opened and behold a white horse. This is why I say that this writer must be the Lord Jesus because now we're in chapter 19 verse 11. Chapter six is the beginning of Israel's destruction. Chapter 19 is the end of, his, of Israel, Jerusalem's destruction. And we find the white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, capital letters, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So there's no question whatsoever that the white horse rider in chapter 19 is the Lord Jesus Christ. And likewise, there can be no question that Jesus is also the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter six. Now remember that these seals are being opened one at a time. So John is only seeing an introduction to what was to follow. The real action doesn't begin until after the seventh seal is opened in Revelation chapter eight and verse one. So please understand, as we open these first six seals, one by one in Revelation chapter six, all we're doing is introducing what is to follow, beginning in chapter eight in verse one. You follow me? These are introductions. It's like if you're writing a book and you write a, an outline, uh, an introduction to the book, giving a brief overview of what is to follow. That is what Revelation chapter six is doing. It's introducing the subject. It's giving an overview of which is to follow, but it's merely an introduction. 
The second seal is verses 3 and 4. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, living creature, say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. Underline that. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, I believe the next three writers are the war angels of Christ, following Christ, descending on the city of Jerusalem in waves of death and destruction. Now, I know there are, there are others that have slightly different interpretations. One uh, friend that I know who wrote a very scholarly work on this subject, uh, he postulates that the four writers represent the four commanding generals of Vespavian's army that came upon the city of Jerusalem. That's fine, if you want to interpret it that way, that, that's, that's, that's okay. I personally believe that the first rider on the white horse is Jesus himself. He's leading this war against Jerusalem because Jerusalem declared war on him, and Jesus is responding. And the other riders are the war angels of Christ coming against the city of Jerusalem. Now notice that this heavenly warrior on the red horse takes peace from the city of Jerusalem and causes the inhabitants of the city to kill one another. That's a very important part of the prophecy. And if you go back and watch my destruction of Jerusalem message, I made mention of this in that message, and I went into more detail, of course, in the message than I'll do here. But inside the city of Jerusalem, a great civil war broke out between the Jews in Jerusalem, and they spared no one, women or children. 8,500 bodies lied rotting on the streets of Jerusalem, killed by their fellow countrymen. 12,000 Jewish leaders were killed, including many Pharisees. Their carcasses lay in heaps along city streets. This was the result of three Jewish factions that were fighting within the city for supremacy. They killed one another just as the angel told John they would. And this happened before the Romans arrived at the city. The Jews in Jerusalem did not even know the Romans were coming. And they were fighting among themselves, killing each other in great numbers. And so as, as, the, as the prophecy said, they killed one another. That literally took place inside the city of Jerusalem before the siege began. The third seal is the black horse, verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The blackness of the horse representing famine comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 5 and verse 10. And I quote, Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. So, the black horse represents famine. And as I noted in the destruction message, Josephus, and I'm going to be talking about Josephus quite a bit in the message today, and I'm going to be quoting from him later in this, in this address. Josephus, who was an eyewitness of Jerusalem's destruction, wrote, and this is not pleasant, but he wrote that the famine was so bad in the city of Jerusalem that mothers were eating their own dead babies. 
That was the, th the third seal, the black horse, the famine that took place in Jerusalem. The fourth seal, the pale horse, verses seven and eight. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse in the name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth. And the word earth there, and I looked that up in Strong's Concordance Dictionary. And Strong tells us that the word earth, it can mean the, the globe or all the earth, but it can also mean a region or a country. And obviously that is the definition that is being used here because we're talking about the city of Jerusalem and the region of Judea. And the fourth part of the earth or the region to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. This passage is reflective of Ezekiel's prediction of Jerusalem's destruction by the Babylonians. The Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem was a precursor to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21, for thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. So you see the prediction even in Ezekiel speaking of not only the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, but the wordage applies to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans that we are discussing today. So the first four seals contain the four horsemen and the fifth and the sixth seals contain no horsemen. And the four horsemen are judgments upon Jerusalem in 70 AD. Folks, that's over 2,000 years ago. This chapter was fulfilled over 2,000 years ago. The application of the four horsemen to anything going on today is pure fabrication and ignorant sensationalism. Christians have been applying current events to the four horsemen of Revelation ever since the days of John Darby and Cyrus Schofield in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Before that period of time, the church understood that this prophecy was already fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice with each horse and rider, and I want you to notice this very carefully because this is very important. With each horse and rider, the beast would say, come and see. Did you notice that? Every single one of them said, come and see. Which means, come and see. Look closely. Take this sight deeply into your heart and to your mind. Focus on what you're going to see. So four times, come and see, look closely, watch carefully, focus intently. By applying these judgment chapters in Revelation, beginning in chapter six, to the second coming, prophetic futurists avoid the significance and meaning of Jerusalem's destruction. In fact, they don't even mention the destruction of Jerusalem. It means nothing to them. So by applying these judgment chapters to the second coming gives them a way to avoid looking, come and seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. 
they don't come and see. They don't see it all. They believe that they will be raptured, which makes the entire, listen, which makes the entire book of Revelation after chapter 4 and verse 1 totally irrelevant to them. Totally irrelevant. They do not see. Come and see. Come and see. See what? What am I supposed to see? Jerusalem's annihilation. And this is, oh, so important. Jerusalem's annihilation. Jerusalem was not just destroyed. Watch the destruction message. It was completely annihilated to the point that Josephus and other historians wrote that when people came by after the destruction of Jerusalem had taken place, they could not even have known that the city even existed. It was totally annihilated. The reason this was done was to convince the world, especially the Christian world, of the death of the Old Covenant and the glory of the New Covenant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss this. The destruction of Jerusalem is all about the New Covenant. It's all about convincing the body of Christ that had just been born that the old covenant was abolished and the new covenant was now theirs. And the new covenant was so superior to the old covenant that God completely abolished the old covenant so that we could see so clearly and wonderfully the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But prophetic futurists magnify and exalt the old covenant and preach so as to bring New Testament believers back under its jurisdiction and authority and to try and resurrect national Israel, which God forever destroyed. Yes. National Israel has forever been destroyed. Therefore, the book of Revelation teaches them nothing. It, it doesn't teach them anything. They just use it to fabricate all kinds of absurdities and then pull out verses at random to try and make it fit a predisposed ideology, which I don't know, puffs them up, makes them feel superior to other people because they know something that they don't know. Oh, guess what? I saw the news last night, and bingo, that was the red horse I heard on the radio. <laughs> you see, all of this stuff is just manufactured fabrication. They just pick it out of thin air. The book of Revelation itself teaches them nothing. And by the way, neither does the book of Galatians. I just thought I'd throw that in. They are totally blind to the destruction of Jerusalem and what it means. Instead, they engage in wild and fanciful, ever-changing prophetic speculations and idolatrous Israel worship. But the four beasts who gave John chapter 6 all said, come and see. Come and see how Jerusalem was conquered. Come and see 
how they killed one another. Come and see the great famine and how they ate one another. Come and see how they were killed with the sword. Come and see, come and see. Now it's not pleasant, but come and see. It's important to understand that the old covenant has been thoroughly abolished and the new covenant by Jesus Christ is now ours, the possession of the body of Christ. That's the significance of the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6. Now we come to the fifth seal, the souls under the altar. I referenced this in a message a couple of weeks ago briefly. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that they be killed and that as they were, should be fulfilled. These are the saints and the prophets murdered by the Pharisees. Jesus takes the persecution of his new covenant people very personally. Remember what Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus? In Acts chapter 9, verse, I mean Acts chapter 22, verse 7, Saul, Saul, Saul was the Pharisee persecutor of the church. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus said to Saul when he knocked him off his donkey. Why persecutest thou me? Every Christian you tortured, you were torturing me. Every, to every Christian you imprisoned, you were imprisoning me. Every one you killed, you were trying to kill me. Why persecutest thou me? From under the altar and dressed in white, these martyred souls cry out to God for justice and vengeance upon their persecutors, the Pharisees. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long will you let this go on? How many more of our brethren must die. When will you take vengeance on them who have slaughtered us? Notice that John was told that these, John was told these martyred souls would rest for a little time, for a little time, and God would answer their prayers. Do you see that? They would rest for a little time and God would answer their prayer. Now this reminds us of what John was told in the very first verse of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The things which must shortly come to pass. You remember that? That goes back to our very first message for it shortly come to pass especially I went into detail in the message when did John write the book of Revelation because that is so significant the things which shortly must come to pass 
If you accept Schofield futurism philosophy of the book of Revelation and all these prophetic predictions, then it's been over 2,000 years and none of them have come to fruition. But John was told by the angel, write the things which shortly must come to pass. And we go into detail of that, especially in that message, when did John write the book of Revelation? So same thing here. These martyred souls are being told, rest for a little while. And then God will answer your prayer. Of course, this has to be the Pharisees who controlled the city of Jerusalem because the city of Jerusalem was notorious for killing God's prophets. I have to read these scriptures to make this point. Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and the first part of 35. Jesus speaking. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. Are you catching this? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Matthew chapter 23, verses 33 through 36. Again, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Ye serpents, Ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I sent unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Think of what Jesus just said. That upon you may come all of the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel the brother of Cain, whom Cain killed the first murder in history. From the blood of righteous Abel until the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. That's a prediction. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. I am going to pour upon you the judgment for all of the righteous martyrs of the world. Matthew Henry writes, just to make this a little bit more clear to you, Christ both alludes to the history of the former Zacharias in Chronicles, you can read that in the book of Chronicles, and foretells the death of this latter, Zacharias, which was recorded in Josephus. Through the latter was not yet slain, yet before this destruction comes in 70 AD, it would be true that they had slain him. In other words, that Zacharias that Jesus is talking about is a man that was alive at that point and had not yet been martyred. But Jesus knew that they were going to martyr him. He knows all things. So he, he starts with Abel, and then he goes up to the death of this Zacharias who died after Jesus' death and resurrection, but before 
70 AD. And so he includes that Zacharias who had not yet been killed, but he was killed just as Jesus predicted he would be killed. And Josephus, Josephus recorded his martyrdom for us in his writing. And Matthew Henry says, so that all shall be put together from first to last. And so from Abel, the first person in the first person murdered in human history to Zacharias the man who was not even killed yet when Jesus spoke the words but would be killed soon by the Pharisees Jesus said all of the blood of all of the martyrs of history from Abel to Zacharias who had not even been killed yet I am going to hold accountable on this generation this generation Matthew 27, verses 22 through 25. Pilate saith unto him, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out to more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that Rather, a tumult was made, a riot. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent from the blood of this just person. Pilate knew he was a just man. But I'm sorry, Mr. Governor, water cannot wash away your sins. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. <laughs> See ye to it, Pilate saying. Then answered all the people back to Pilate, saying, This sends chills up my spine when I read it. His blood be on us and on our children. Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. Jesus speaking. And shall not God avenge his own elect? How long, O Lord? Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, listen carefully. Luke 18, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Speedily. It will not take long, and their blood will be avenged. In 70 AD, the blood of Christ and the prophets would be required of the city of Jerusalem. And the prayers of the souls under the altar would be answered. The sixth seal. A great earthquake. The sun became black. The moon became blood. Stars fell to the earth and mountains are moved out of their places. And everybody says, oh, this has to be about the second coming thousands of years in the future or whenever it takes place because this has never happened again they don't see anything revelation 6 12 and i beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood now this verse comports with jesus words in luke chapter 21 verse 11 listen carefully and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. All of these things were literally fulfilled during the siege of Judea and Jerusalem. There were great earthquakes, and this is a matter of historical record. 
There were great earthquakes in Rome, Apamea, Syria, Crete, Smyrna, Miletus, Laodicea, Hierapolis, Colossae, and a dreadful earthquake in Jerusalem a short time before the Roman siege against Jerusalem began, from which the fires and smoke blackened the sun and bloodied the moon. Yes, it did take place. Revelation chapter 6, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, and she is shaken of a mighty wind. Verse 14, first part. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. All right, what you are reading here is apocalyptic language for total destruction. That's what this is saying. This is apocalyptic language for total destruction. Let me prove this to you. In Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10, speaking of the Babylonian destruction, listen to the language. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to see. Isaiah 34, verse 4. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Do you see it? And all the hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Same language. This is apocalyptic language for total destruction. Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7, you're going to see the same thing. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and will make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and moon shall not give her light. And the bright lights of heaven will I make dark the stars over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. Again, all these predicting the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. This is a, the language of apocalypse. This is the language of total destruction. In Joel chapter 2, it's said again, verses 30 and 31, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now Isaiah and Ezekiel are predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Joel is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Because he adds something that Isaiah and Ezekiel omit. And that is the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. That's omitted from the prophecy of the Babylonian destruction. Therefore, Ezekiel and Isaiah don't mention it, but Joel does. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, I'm going to read you a brief quote from Adam Clark. And I want you to listen very carefully because to me this is one of the greatest statements I've ever read from anyone relative to the subject at hand. And he's using the phrase, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And Clark writes, in the taking and sacking of Jerusalem and burning of the temple by the Romans under Titus, the son of Vespasian. This, listen, this was perhaps the greatest and most terrible day of God's vengeance ever shown to the world or that ever will be shown 
till the great day of the general judgment. The greatest and most terrible day of God's vengeance ever shown to the world. I don't think Adam Clark forgot about the flood. I don't think Adam Clark forgot about Sodom and Gomorrah. The greatest and most terrible day of God's vengeance ever shown to the world or that ever will be shown to the great day of the general judgment. Revelation 6, 14b. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, as we go through the Revelation, you're going to notice quite a bit of repetition. And please remember this. This is important as we go forward. Revelation is not written in strict chronological order. Please understand that. And we're going to see this pretty quickly as we continue to go forward. It's not written in strict chronological order. For example, we will see the terminology that's used here in this passage again in chapter 16. And we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 16. But you're going to see the same language that's used in chapter 6, used in chapter 16. So it's not in strict chronological order. And again, chapter 6 is giving you an introduction to what is yet to come. So let's notice today the moving of the mountains. As we discussed in the destruction of Jerusalem message, which looks like this if you haven't got it that's what it looks like Jerusalem was built on seven mountains these mountains served many purposes including being a great natural impediment to invading armies very very difficult for invaders to attack the city of Jerusalem because of the mountainous terrain and because of the mountains upon which Jerusalem was built. Very easily defended and very difficult for invaders. So now is where I'm going to quote from Josephus because Josephus, an eyewitness to the destruction of Jerusalem, and he's going to explain what John says here about the moving of the mountains. I quote Josephus. Agrippa observed that even the affairs of the Romans were likely to be in danger while such an immense multitude of their enemies, speaking of the Jews, had seized upon the mountains. Please notice every time he talks about mountains and such like. Now, Jadapada, I let me stop. Jadapada was a Jewish city about 100 miles from Jerusalem that fell early in Vespasian's siege against Judea in 67 AD. So Jadapada fell about three years before Jerusalem fell. Josephus, remember the Roman campaign was not just against Jerusalem, that was the the ultimate prize, but it was against the entire region of Judea. Josephus was the commander of the Jewish forces at Jadapata and was taken prisoner after the city had fallen. And so he became the historian of the Roman siege from that point onward. And that's why we have the great volume of history that Josephus wrote, because he was not killed in the siege of Jadapata. He was taken prisoner 
and became a scribe and wrote the history of the siege. So now let me go back to what Josephus wrote. Now, Jotapata, almost all of it built on a precipice of a mountain, having on all the other sides of it every way valleys and immensely deep and steep, insomuch that those who would look down would their sight fail them before it reaches the bottom. It was so deep and so high, you could look down into the valley portion and not even see the bottom. It is only to come on the north side where the utmost part of the city is built on the mountains as it ends obliquely at a plain. Are you following me? This mountain, Josephus, okay, so Josephus is writing, and Josephus calls himself by name. He doesn't say, this mountain I had encompassed. He says, this mountain, Josephus, speaking of himself, had encompassed with a wall when he fortified the city, that its top may not be capable of being seized upon by the enemies. The city is covered all around with other mountains, and can no way be seen till a man just comes upon it. This was the strong situation of Jotapata. Vespasian, therefore, and this is not even Jerusalem, this is a lesser city, understand. Vespasian, therefore, in order to try how he might overcome the natural strength of the place, as well as the bold defense of the Jews, made a, revol a, a resolution to prosecute the siege with vigor. To that end, he called the commanders that were under him to a council of war and consulted with them which way the assault might be managed to the best advantage. A great multitude prevented their approach and came out of Jericho and fled to those mountainous parts that lay over against Jerusalem. Do you see the predominance of the mountains as Josephus tells the story of the siege? Fled to the mountains parts that lay against Jerusalem while that part which was left behind was in great measure destroyed, they also found the city desolate. Now let me quote Josephus further. Now Vespasian was very desirous of demolishing Jotapata, for he had gotten intelligence that the greatest part of the enemy had retired thither and that it was on all accounts a place of great security to them. Accordingly, he set forth footmen and horsemen to level the road, which was mountainous and rocky, to level the road, which was mountainous and rocky. Titus, intending to pitch his camp nearer to the city, placed as many of his choice horsemen and footmen as, as he those had, had sufficient opposite to the Jews to prevent their sallying, attacking, out upon them, while he gave orders for the whole army to level the distance as far as the wall of the city. So they threw down all the hedges and walls which the inhabitants had made about their gardens and groves of trees, cut down all the fruit trees that lay between them and the wall of the city, filled the, up the hollow places and the chasms, and demolished the rocky precipices with iron instruments and thereby made all the place level. Now, did you, did you hear what Josephus said? They leveled the road. They leveled the distance. They, they made all the place level. The Roman army literally moved the mountains of Judea and Samaria in their assault of the cities of Judea. 
just as the angel said would happen. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains. Again, this begins the detailed description of what happened during the Roman siege against Judea and especially against the city of Jerusalem. I'll show the significance of the kings of the earth and the rich men later in our series. Let me quote Josephus again. And on this day it was that the Romans slew all the multitudes that appeared openly. But on the following days, they searched the hiding places and fell upon those that were underground and in the caverns. So now the last hope was in the caves and the caverns underground, whither If they could once fly, they did not expect to be searched for, but endeavored that after the whole city should be destroyed and the Romans gone away, they might come out again and escape from them. This was no better than a dream of theirs, for they were not able to hide either from God or from the Romans. However, they depended on those underground subterfuges. Josephus, their last chance to escape certain death was to hide in the mountains and the caverns and the caves, not expecting the Romans to look for them there, but no. The, the Romans searched the caverns and the caves. They went underground with tools and great and mighty tools to dig them out one man at a time and killed every one of them. Hide us, Revelation. Say to the mountains and to the rocks, hide us. There was no hiding. Verses 16 and 17. And they said to the mountains and rocks, first they said, hide us. And then they realize they can't hide and they say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Oh, this is so rich. They could not escape the wrath of God. I quote Josephus once more. The Romans slew some of them. Some they carried captives. Others they made a search for underground. And when they found where they were, they broke up the ground and slew all they met. Jesus predicted this very day as he was being led to the cross in Luke chapter 23, verses 28 through 30. Listen to what Jesus said. As he's carrying his cross to Calvary, And the women are crying over his suffering. Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem. He didn't say daughters of the world. Daughters of Jerusalem. Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, the days are coming, 
in the which they shall say, blessed are the barren, the childless, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps that never gave suck. Listen to this. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. The chills go up down your spine. Jesus said to the women, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your, your children. The days coming they shall get, they shall say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And that's exactly what the angel told John they would say in Revelation chapter 6. Do you see how a proper interpretation of the scripture makes it all fit together? Now, Revelation 6, 16 and 17, I want to read them again and make a different emphasis. In, in my heart, I've been waiting the whole message for this point right here. <laughs> Revelation 6, 16 and 17, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us. And here's what I want you to notice. From the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath, the Lamb, is come, and who shall be able to stand? They didn't say, save us from the Roman army. They didn't say, save us from Titus. They said, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. Oh, these are the Pharisees. These are the Jews that crucified Christ that are saying, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. They heard John the Baptist say, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Dispensational futurists apply this chapter and the rest of the judgment chapters to the Antichrist. If you haven't watched Prophecy Message number four, <laughs> Antichrist, Antichrist, the man of sin and the falling away, we go into the subject of the Antichrist. They apply all of these chapters to the Antichrist, to the work of the Antichrist. But clearly, this chapter is not showing, is not showing us Antichrist. This chapter is showing us Jesus Christ. <laughs> As in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, that's my second message, where I talk about the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. Schofieldists take plain scriptural references to Christ and apply them to Antichrist. They did that in our, Revel in our Daniel message, in Daniel chapter 9, where we talked about the 70 weeks. Remember that? they apply the passage that is referencing the glory, the beauty, the majesty, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they apply it to Antichrist. You know, it's, it's on the verge of blasphemy, in my opinion, to apply anything that belongs to Jesus to the Antichrist. But they do that all the time. They did it in, in the Daniel, and they do it here in Revelation chapter 6. They take what belongs to Christ and they apply it to Antichrist. But they do that to make it fit their preconceived notion of what the way things are. 
Instead of accepting what God says in his word for what it is, they have to fabricate it to make it fit the Schofield model of prophecy. And to do that, they've got to do all kinds of spiritual contortions. But notice what they said. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. The Pharisees and chief rulers in Jerusalem knew Amen. Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. They knew he rose from the dead. And they remembered his promise to destroy the city of Jerusalem, the Olivet Discourse. They remembered that. They knew he rose from the dead. They remembered his promise to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And when that dreadful day came, they knew that the Roman armies were the instruments of Christ's promised judgment upon them. In their last moments of life, they cried to be spared from the wrath of the resurrected Lamb of God. No mention of the Roman armies. Powerful testimony to the guilty hearts of the Pharisees. And I want to remind you that this was the Pharisees' motive against Christ from the very beginning. You know, I'm almost done. In all of my Bible college training, in all of my Bible teaching, in all of the conferences I attended, in all of the preachers that I've heard hundreds and hundreds of them in my lifetime. I've never heard a message, not one, on the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one single message. I had to learn this on my own. Well, the truth be told, most of what I've learned came after I graduated from college, not while I was in college. And I also never heard a message on John chapter 11, verses 47 and 48. Would you turn there? Take the moment to turn there, because I think it's important that we understand this in the context of what we're talking about now. John chapter 11, verses 47 and 48. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we do? For this man, Jesus, doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And notice the rest of it. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place, their position, their power, their riches, and nation, our nation of, of Judah. If we let him alone, the Romans shall come, take away our position, our power, and they will take away our nation entirely. The Pharisees from the very beginning in the ministry of Jesus Christ why did the Pharisees hate him so much? 
Why did they try to stone him so often? Why were they so intent on killing him? It's this verse right here. They instinctively knew that the kingdom of Christ would dethrone their power and destroy their riches, and they knew that Rome would be the instrument of their destruction. They instinctively knew all of that. To understand this, you've got to watch my third message, God's Chosen People, the Children of Promise, the Israel of God, in Romans chapter 11. This explains all of that in that third message. But the Pharisees understood it from the very beginning. His kingdom will destroy our position and it will bring the Romans upon us which will destroy our country. They had the innate instinct, I'm sure given them by God, to understand the judgment that was coming upon them through the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather than confess their sin to Christ, accept him as their Lord, Messiah, and King, and become part of his glorious kingdom, they chose to make themselves his mortal enemies. It was a fight to the death. And they thought they had won when they saw him hanging on a cross. But when he rose from the dead, they knew his promise to destroy them and their city would take place. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear this. National Israel is forever destroyed. And the Israel of God is the new covenant church. <laughs> to be consistent with the plain teaching of Scripture, our understanding of prophecy must align with the biblical truth that there is no future national Israel or any present natural children of Abraham on earth. The only children of Abraham on earth are the spiritual children of Abraham made such by faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen to me very carefully because you have friends and loved ones. Maybe you yourself are struggling with this just like I did for so long and most of the people in this room. Being taught dispensational futurism. Please understand that anyone who believes in a millennial kingdom that includes the restoration of national Israel does not fully understand the new covenant. And I've had several Baptists and Pentecostals write me over the last week or so, chiding me, saying 
that they understand the new covenant. And how dare I suggest that they don't understand the new covenant. Of course, we all understand their misunderstanding because we were there. I thought I understood the new covenant. My goodness gracious, I was taught in some of the most conservative theological colleges in America. I sat at the feet of some of the most scripturally astute from that perspective, educated, popular, successful preachers that America had to offer. I sat under their feet, I listened to them, I, I took notes on everything they'd said, and I studied their lessons, I, I read their books, I studied their books. I, I was trained in all of that. If you would have suggested to me 15 years ago that I didn't understand the new covenant, I would have said the same thing that some of you are saying. Of course I understand the new covenant. I understand Jesus died on the cross for me. I understand he rose from the dead. I understand that, that, he, uh, that he rose to the Father. I understand that we must receive him by faith to be saved. Of course I understand the new covenant. No, you don't. And I didn't. I didn't understand it. I thought I did. I understood everything I'd been taught. But I didn't understand fully the new covenant, which was what God began to use in my heart and in my soul to disturb my conscience to cause me to begin to study for myself what the Bible actually says, instead of relying on what man had told me. And that's when I realized through my study that the new covenant destroyed, after fulfilling it, the old covenant. And that the destruction of the city of Jerusalem was the symbol, the great act of finality of the new covenant over the old covenant, that it was a, a visible, terrible sign to the world, but especially to the church, that the old covenant was abolished and the new covenant was now ours. And any prophecy interpretation that includes the restoration of a national Israel proves, by definition, that you don't understand the old covenant, uh, the new covenant, excuse me, that you don't understand the new covenant. You're still for a Jewish Messiah to resurrect the Jewish nation, which has been forever destroyed. And how, how much clearer could God have made it? What possible other sign could he have given the church than that which he gave us? That's why the angel said, come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. Why? I want you to see the old covenant is gone and the new covenant is alive forevermore. Anyone who believes in the millennial kingdom, and this will be important as we get 
further into our discussion when we get talking about the millennium itself. Anyone who believes in a millennial kingdom that includes the restoration of national Israel does not fully understand the new covenant. For me, this truism must guide our interpretation of the book of Revelation and has guided me through the study to this point and will guide me through the study until it's finished. Remember again, I've said this several times, chapter six of Revelation details the opening of the first six seals. This is merely an introductory summary of Jerusalem's destruction. <laughs> Take a good hard look at Revelation 6 and what we've already seen. And this is just the introduction of what is still to come? Yes. The details of Jerusalem's destruction begin in earnest in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1 when he opens the seventh seal. The next prophecy message, prophecy message number 10, will be from Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000. That'll be our subject next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, teach our hearts. Help us, Lord, to unlearn the errors of the past. Freshen our hearts and our minds with the truth that you have given us in your word. May this chapter truly be the introduction in our hearts and our minds to that which is to follow, that we will be able to respond to the four living creatures, as they said, come and see. And my Lord, I pray by the time we're finished, we'll be able to respond to them and say, I see. In Jesus' name, amen.